Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Grown ups in between cheering and babies right about now. Back again. It's your boys, the PE3 with another episode of Behind Enemy Not Blah, Blah, Blah. I can't even talk. I can't even talk. I'm so busy doing all of this over here, playing with the soundboard and all of that, trying to trying to get fresh and trying to trying to get this thing right. Let's get it right, though. We are here with Chris Dunn. Let's go ahead and move you right over here. <laughs> I like to put the guests and the interviews right front and center. So back again, welcome back to uh, the Public Enemies Podcast. How are you, sir? Thank you, guys. I'm, I'm pumped to be here. I feel we're uh, really developing a real Sami Zayn bloodline dynamic. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> hey, who's going to look at him, though, like this? Like... I like that. I like yeah. that. I like that. I'll take a, <laughs> so, I'll take a but... bump for any of you guys. Yeah, hey, that's what I'm talking about, man. <laughs> Take a bump, man. What's the what's the what's the uh, what's the uh, the bump card like? Like, is there an actual physical bump card? Like, is there a thing with that? Like, you know, do you like actually get handed one when you get to the PC? I mean, I wish. I think you really start to notice it when you see people walking backstage. It's yeah. like you know, like. When you see Matt Hardy walk to the ring, you know his bum card is full. <laughs> oh, yeah. Bro, he's been he been walking been like, that since like 2011. Yeah. yeah. He should have been turned that bum card in and got his um got his Slurpee. That is crazy. <laughs> that is crazy. All right. Well, <clears throat> we talked before. You were on the pod a couple of months ago, but we did want to come back and do like a more long form type interview and kind of pick your brain uh, uh, of about, you know, your time in WWE and like writing and stories and, you know, just get some, some of your perspective of how the backstage environment and certain events, you know, are <laughs> and how they're produced, you know, for real. Yeah. So uh, given that you were there for what, like seven years almost? Was it seven? Not five, but five. It, felt five. Like, it felt like 10. So like, right it's like, it felt like, <laughs> Jesus Christ, my life. Oh my God, I'm gray hairs two yeah. years in. It was like a presidency. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm like 27. So. <laughs> <laughs> Looking 55. So, so what is your, yeah, what, like, where does your wrestling story start? Like, where does that background come from? Like, did, were you like a fan growing up or how do you, how do you get into it? Yeah, I, I loved it. I grew up, I, I caught WWE for the first time when I was uh, seven. Actually, so before that, as a kid, I watched, like as really young, I would watch like the, the animated Hulk Hogan rock and wrestling show. But then when I was like seven, um i i caught wwe superstars for the first time on saturday morning i was hooked and then like you know throughout like the years like i think like as most people do like i kind of like went in and out of it so like once i was kind of like you know probably like 11 i stopped until i was like a teenager and the attitude era was hopping and then like you know i think like the attitude era started to dip and then i kind of got back into it in college and off as an adult but like probably the last like, like three or four years before I started working at WWE. I was like watching every week. Um, I was really good friends with um, uh, a couple of people who were also like big fans. So like, I remember like um, I was working at a talent agency. So like uh, one of the rocks agents took me to WrestleMania 29 when he faced Cena. Um, and then I got like free tickets the next night to uh, the night that Dolph cashed in. And everyone's booing the shit out of Randy and, and Seamus. So, like, my, my buddy and I, instead of watching, I think it was the Final Four that night for the National Championship game, like, we we took the train from from New York to, to Jersey to go, you know, see Raw. Um, and it was totally worth it. It was an amazing Raw. Um, it kind of felt like, to me as a fan, like, the first Raw where, like, the night after Mania kind of seemed like a thing. Um, and, yeah, like, I always loved it. And, like, it's, you know, I think it's hard to – a lot of content especially now it's hard to watch everything when you you know, have a job and responsibilities and stuff but you know i would always like if i miss something i always check in on it you know i really you know love the you know the kevin owens sammy seth rollins generation that was coming in um you know the women's revolution was great um and like i, I and then like i was doing some work for seven bucks the rocks production company um and somebody had the idea when i was helping them with a project um, and went to Brian Gowertz and was like, Hey, do you think Chris would be a good writer for WWE? 
and he gave me a horrified look. Uh, not because of <laughs> not because of me, but like you know, it's like uh, the writing job is is not easy there, um, and you are not uh, as as Twitter will tell you well liked. Um, so. Um, so yeah, like I took some time to think about like whether I wanted to do it because I knew the high turnover rate of the job and like how crazy it was. And I was like, well, you know, seven year old me would like kick my ass if I, if I passed on this. And like, even if it's like six to like nine months and I got fired, like hopefully I get to a mania, but like more importantly, like, you know, I, I went to film school. I was a writer. I kind of got out of that through entertainment. I was like, this is an opportunity for me to get my writing chops back up because I'll be in a writer's room. Um, and I also will be writing every week because it's 52 weeks. And it's like at that time, it was five hours of TV. And, you know, I was writing all the time. So what's the interview process for that? Like, do you like, like <laughs> you go up to like Stanford and like, you sit in the, like you sit in like the lobby. Look at your shit. And, like, <laughs> this is, is why I go to fifth grade. You'll say my best piece of work right here. It, so it's really weird. And it's like the weird thing about working at WWE is because like, you know, wrestling comes from carnies in like the 1910s, 1920s. Like, right. you know, marks, like it's a term because like they were trying to steal people's money uh so you have like the natural carny blood of the business but it's also a publicly traded company so you have the uh <laughs> the wall street element of the business the hr element of the business so it's like i had to like i had to um i i, I had brian put a word in for me I had applied on the website and like I wrote like a long thing and I made a joke about Hurricane Rana uh, in, in what I wrote. It was like a little like why, like why I'm interested in the job, like thing that you see like any company does. And like the HR woman had like no idea what Hurricane Rana was. She was like, did you misspell Hurricane? You should really uh, check your notes. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know if like, wow, hurricanes you're are... applying for a writer job and you can't even yeah. spell Hurricane? <laughs> yeah. And then like we were like, we were talking about, I brought up NXT and like there was like weird confusion, but like she thought NXT was called Next. Uh, <laughs> so uh, she's no longer at the company. But uh, right. <laughs> no, <we're good>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they gave her her 90 days and you know, best wishes in future endeavors. Um, but, um, but yeah, like so I, I did that and then I. Um, I had an interview with Tom Cassiello, who was there for like, I was there for him a few months. He was there for about like six years. He played a, a big deal kind of, and, you know, you know, getting the women on TV in a better way. Um, and was just like a, a really good writer. He, he interviewed me on the phone. He sent me, um, he gave me like a, what happens in like a lot of uh, entertainment industry and entertainment jobs when you're more going for like late night shows um he had me like write a sample a packet so i had to pick five storylines or i had to pitch five storylines and five matches for whatever and i'm blanking out the july pay-per-view before SummerSlam 2016 and i had to beat out every week of that um for five weeks um <laughs> which is a lot more work than they give people now um and Ooh. that is hate um but um yeah so, so, what was what was one of those stories what was one of those that you pitched what was one of those I, ideas I, I have to look at it like one was Miz becoming intercontinental champion and him and cena i forget what the issue i pitched with him and cena having but um but essentially Miz doing an inter a weekly intercontinental open challenge every week to try to elevate it because he was elevate the title because he was jealous of Cena. Hmm. But every week he would heal his way out of the match or like get intentionally get disqualified. Uh -huh. um, essentially building to, you know, Cena kind of like talking about putting pride on the title since he's never won the Intercontinental title on going to that match. Um, but um, yeah, it was like there was a few different things. Like one was, I, that's the one I remember off the top of my head, but I, I felt at the time that they were kind of getting towards more like wrestling wrestling. So I kind of wrote it like a booker and I kind of got the, like the Iggy going into it, 
that they they were wondering that like I'm too sports based as a writer. Um, can I do entertainment? Can I tell actual like story stories? So like in the interview, like they they kind of asked that a little bit. I met with Ed Kosky, Dave Kapoor, and Tom, and I had like some sort of um, end zone cast pitch where you know I essentially kind of went into a personal story about them being brothers to kind of show that I could do that too. Um, it was a very interesting interview. Uh, I think they just came off a horrible meeting with Vince. Everyone was incredibly negative. Uh, and I was, luckily, like, I think compared to like most people though, like I, I had a good feeling that that's what the job was. So like I, I wasn't thrown off because of that. One writer was so negative in that interview that he was oh. no longer allowed to interview people. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <I know. laughs> Yo, God, like, yeah, you can't do that. You can't do yeah, that. Yeah, that person, that person is not named in this, but uh, it's uh, yeah, they are. They are no longer allowed to do that. Wow. Yeah. Man. All right. Oh, you have anything constructive to say about this guy? Nah, he sucks, man. This yeah, is, man. This, this, is a, out of here. this is a horrible <laughs> job. <laughs> like it's already hard enough, and it's like, bro, like I gotta do all of this to get chastised the whole time, like while yeah. I'm actually doing the job as well. Like, wow, that's crazy. Exactly. That is nuts. Um, okay, so I, I got a question. Me. Let's 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 go ahead and get into the to the meat and the potatoes. You feel me? Uh, to the to the isms. You know what I'm saying? Have that Irish My, dinner, right? <laughs> so. My first question to you is the writing process during like something like a draft. How does that work exactly? Do you like get the information like beforehand, like which who's going where and like what brand is taking like which performers or whatever? Because I know that they might be having a draft coming up soon. So I'm wondering like how exactly soon in advance would you get that information or how do you kind of lay that out every year i was there completely varied um it's like those are the highest level conversations um now like there have been ones where it's been like planned out months in advance there have been ones that have like changed even day of um but usually like this is how you want to do it uh you pick your top man and woman for me to work brand mm -hmm. uh and then you pick their opponents for the year and like what are fresh matches and kind of go from there so like you know anytime you have a, like a brock meeting it's like who are brock's opponents for the year who are roman's opponents for the year charlotte who's her 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 opponent becky so you kind of just like go through that because you want to make sure that you're when it comes to a wrestling show if your top talent is successful everything else can like work down from that um so that's what you kind of want to do like um you kind of want to build around your big temples like SummerSlam, rumble mania and the draft process but it, it varies consistently but you want to try to get ahead of it and it was like a little different pre-pandemic because <clears throat> you also have to take travel into account for the live events so it's like you usually want to plan those a couple weeks out to so you're not like just burning through money. We um, sometimes that happens. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, lead writers a lot of times will like try to discuss things before presenting it to kind of see like who wants who, uh, who doesn't. Um, if there's like a trade to make, a suggestion to make, um, just to kind of make sure that both your shows are taken care of. Occasionally, uh, you know, some people will like go rogue, like. Uh, there was a, a lead writer who wasn't great who uh, I know he was like up there <clears throat> and like he pitched randomly like, hey Vince, why don't we change commentators? And like, it's like, oh, we're, we're having that conversation. But um, like uh, usually you just kind of want to like plan it out with your like the lead writers so they're kind of on the same page so both rosters are working efficiently. It's crazy. Yeah. Like, so Vince, so Vince, let's talk about Ray J. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to ask you about Ray J. I want to ask you about Ray J. This whole time, how would you book Ray J? I will book oh, him if it was him versus Logan Paul, or like you think you can book like you think it would be easier to book Ray J or Krishan Rock? You know what I'm saying because she's an actual Power Ranger. 
Oh my god. <laughs> well, you know, it's like if you if you saw how like the the how Arrow was in WWE, I'm sure that like the Power Ranger will kill it. Um, but like Ray J, like I think you got like. I, I think the, the whole reason you brought Braun Strowman back was to put Ray J over, then Drew, then Roman. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? For the Carter, yeah. do you imagine? Yeah. I mean, quote Michael Hayes, you want to make money or don't you? So. <laughs> Maybe seeing one problem. wish in Cardiff instead of American Pie would have been crazy. <laughs> That's fire. <laughs> that is fire. So, hey man, you were there for like. So you said you were there for five years. The whole time you were there, what was the? What would you say was the biggest story that you had a hand in producing? I mean, like writing. And everything. Um, I always say the the probably the biggest one. Like I, I was lucky where like when I started, I wasn't producing this, but like the first thing that really was kind of cool was, um, I wrote a lot of promos for the Triple H Seth Rollins story for Mania. And mm. a lot, I didn't produce any of that, but like the thing that was like really cool was um, Hunter was keeping a lot of my stuff, probably like 50 to 70%. He wasn't changing it. He changes a lot of it. Um, but like the thing that like I'm most proud of and like I always like um, was like, I, well, um, Thank God this isn't live because I'm fucking up right now. Uh, like uh, the thing, like I kind of like started getting attention at the company with was like working with the Street Profits. Um, I did some stuff with them in NXT, and then Heyman wanted to bring them to Raw, um, mm. and Heyman went to Joe Val Castro, who was like the lead writer of NXT. He was like, "Who should I put the Street Profits with?" He recommended me, and we were together at the hip my whole time like their whole time on the main roster until i left like i think outside like three segments um i was writing with them the whole time so that's the thing that like yeah. kind of caught vince's attention with me where like he i was gonna say didn't know what to make of me I'll, I'll be frank he did not like me at the time uh but mm -hmm. but um uh once yeah. he saw me working with them and like my work with the 24 7 title um and how I was doing with the crossover stuff, like he he started to trust me more. Um, but the thing, like the biggest thing that I'm most proud of is like Bianca working with Bianca. Like we get that whole year, like it was such a wild thing. Like and a big part of that working with her was like I was really worried at the time because I think anybody that sees Bianca Belair kind of like knows like this is what a she's unbelievable. Like it's it's kind of undeniable. Um, I think for whatever reason, we had a couple of writers on the team that weren't around that long, who I think were having a negative impact on the women's division. Um, and I was also close to, to. I'm also like close to Tez, so like I I kind of campaigned to like let me work with Bianca. Um, so like we started developing those Mister Perfect vignettes, and like the goal was like to get her to the main event of WrestleMania year one. Cause like, it, you know, we need new stars and like, it felt like that was legitimately possible. Um, and it was really hard. And like, unlike like writing for, you know, Tez and Dawkins like that, a lot of that was like, I would write it. They would barely make any changes. Like I got to know them really well. So I knew their voice. Like I had to kind of like go back and like really get to know Bianca to like learn her voice. And like, we would hop on the, like hop on the phone together. Like, every week where I would like give her like, this is a story. This is like the, this is my first draft of like where the story should go. And like, she would keep some stuff. She wouldn't keep some stuff. And like, as time went on, like I kind of got to know her voice more, but it was more about like, you know, we became friends and I kind of, I felt like my, I felt we kind of figured out how to navigate the political elements together, which were very, you know, it's very tough in the women's division because there was, you know, less time. Um, and you know, I'm just proud. Like, she and when I say like I'm involved in, like, I, I just want to be like very upfront. Like, when it comes to like writers are writers, and like you can write something really great, it's all talent. Like, the talent they are like they make or break something. Um, they can take a something that was really bad and make it great, they can take something like really great and make it horrible. Um, and she always made anything I gave her great. Um, <clears throat> And like we, 
like we kind of really put a plan together after those vignettes, like, okay, like how do we get her over with Vince? And luckily like Bailey was very much about like making Bianca in a great way. And was like such a giving partner uh, to her in that story. But like, you know, we were talking about it. Like I remember like, you know, Vince loved the uh, Lashley and uh, Sami Zayn obstacle course. Loved it. And also we had the numbers to back it up because the segment, like you'd be shocked, like stuff that like, you know, wrestling Twitter hates, like arm wrestling contests, uh, obstacle courses, things like that. Yeah. They rate, they rate well. They rate really well. Uh, like I've seen the arm wrestling contests and like yeah. the ratings for those, like, like yeah. I right. yeah, pulls off the yeah. pitch, like run it up. They always do well. It's it's I, it doesn't make sense, but they always do well. And I was like, all right, so this obstacle course, like I went to Bailey's writer, and I was like, I think we have something here. Um, and because like it would really get to show off all of Bianca's things to this. Mm. And it was like it it took a couple weeks. We finally got it um to the pr- production meeting. And then like luckily, like, you know, Adam Pierce and Daniel Bryan got like heavily involved and like um like I didn't produce it, like or write it, like I pitched it. Um and I kind of was like around helping like Jen Pepperman, who's brilliant with the women's division she she handled producing it uh but like daniel bryan and Adam pierce you know jumped in and like they added elements to make it bigger i forget which one of them came up with the idea of lifting otis and then the other one like doubled down of like okay you do gable but then you do otis to build it mm. um and like it really blew vince away and then like the next the next thing was like i was like like okay you are she had lost to Bailey, which upset a lot of people, but I think helped her in the long run because I think it's really hard to have an unbeatable baby face. Um, yes. So, and I think it made the second match better. So I was just like, listen, you go out there, I don't give a, a shit what you say. Like, we have this promo. Like, I told, like, I think I told her, like, if you say something they don't like, I will take any heat for it. But you need to cry. You need to be emotional. You need to really feel the moment. And like this is, like, this is the big. This is literally the biggest moment of your career. It is gonna, this promo is going to say a lot? You need to actually feel it. And she cried, and it was emotional. And it was awesome. And like, Vince really won her over. But it didn't look like she was going to win the Royal Rumble. Um, and I, I started looking into. And I talked about this on another podcast. Like I talked, uh, looking into putting a tag team together with her and Billy Kay, where oh. I thought we can kind of do like a modern rock and sock connection with them. Um, and like I was That'll like, be living... hilarious. yeah, it would have been, it would have been awesome. But like, and I was like playing in, like we were, I was in a ho- in a Tampa hotel room, um, and we were watching like some sort of football game. And like they had just like a an assistant had just left the Royal Rumble night before meeting, um, and they changed the finish and like Charlotte was going to go over, um, and Bianca and they rehearsed Charlotte going over and Bianca was going to get eliminated like midway through the match, um, and it got changed to Bianca going over and like I think a lot of people voiced it but like this guy Ryan Ward who's been there for like. 14 years he he was seen as writer and probably in my for my money like i think has had the biggest hand in the women's revolution he was like lead writer golden days of nxt when like kevin and sammy and like the four horse women all that stuff from my understanding from what i heard like he kind of said like to vince some, something in fact like vince like can, if you look at the royal rumble tomorrow we have edge winning and charlotte winning. we're not making any new stars um and i think that really resonated and like bianca was on such a roll where it kind of made sense and then she also had to like again like right after that match really nail that post-match promo um and she did it and like she was just awesome and, and great That was the same as Drew shit, right? My bad. No, that's me. That's me. Uh, what do you what do you, what do you think about like where Bianca is now and like where she, like how she's come 
full circle with like coming back to the the Bailey story and like she's even got like outside ventures going on now like she just recently signed with WME and yeah like, I think she's crushing it I think she's really you know is coming into her her prime like she hasn't been doing this that long right um and I think she's been in a lot of high level spots and I think you know it's 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 really tough um, I think when you become champion in the women's division to kind of keep your momentum. And I think she's doing a good job of that. And there are now more and more opponents. Um, and I think there are stories to tell to kind of eventually build to either a Ronda story or a Charlotte story. Um, and I think she, she just has to keep being her. And I think it will be more on the hardest, the hardest part sometimes about like, when you're in a writer's room, a wrestling writer's room or like a booker is the opponents. Mm-hmm. Cause like, if you have a, like a shitty opponent, like, it's just like, Oh, like, like, you know, like if this person has lost like for a year straight, like you can make somebody really hot really quickly, but it's just a little tougher in the women's division. Cause unfortunately and it sucks. Like they, they don't get enough time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think like right now with what Hunter's done by putting, you know, Bailey's group together, um, you've kind of given this great heel group that kind of gives you a lot of matches. So I think, I think it's going to help every woman on the roster, you know, including Bianca. I don't, that's dope. I don't, that's yeah. dope. That's dope. I agree. Um, yeah. you guys got a question. I want to take it back. Yeah. I want to, and, and by the way, sorry for talking to Talking too much. Please interrupt me if you no, want to. Interview. Uh, definitely not. You uh, dropped some gems, bro. Like uh, you yeah. talk, you you just mentioned like uh, factions, like them doing with damage control or anything. Well, how do you feel about them like building more factions within the company right now? Is that something that they used to be like against or or? Um, like... I think like they were. I, I think like whether they are against it or not, I think like it was more of a principle versus practice thing. Like, I think they liked, um, like the idea of factions. The issue is when it comes to factions and tag teams to a lesser extent, and it's changed a little bit now because there are less live events. Um, live events cost money to put on. Um, and you, if you haven't, you have to kind of also look at every wrestler as an act. So like if Roman Reigns was an act, you're paying for his hotel. Uh, you're paying for his his flight. Yeah, yeah, yada. Um, if you if a if the street profits are an act, you're paying for two flights. Um, if you have you know a faction, you're paying for you know four to five to whatever. So it's a partially is a commerce thing. Um, I I don't always agree with that because I think like you have your people and you send them and you get your matches. Um, but you kind of have to take the money into account. I think it's good that more factions and groups are happening. Um, I, I just hope it doesn't become like AEW when you got like, you know, every, everybody has a faction, you know, it's like, like the warriors. Yeah. It's like you, like essentially like the teacher assigns you the group. So you're not like left out in recess. Um, (laughs) (laughs) That's like a funny because now I'm thinking like, okay, so I'm thinking back to that quote where, like, they say Vince McMahon is like, oh, why you don't do more tag team matches? And he's like, well, why would I pay? Like, I got to pay four guys instead of two guys, you know? Like, yeah. Like, that's an expense, you know? So it's like, okay. So it could just be, like, one of those types of things. Not necessarily always, like, not that I don't like doing that or not that I don't think that that would be dope as well, but, like, financially maybe sometimes not the best idea yeah and like if you look at like nxt like they've been really big about factions but they also yeah. like they don't they really have like live them. events outside of florida so it's yeah. like they would occasionally and they, they did start going on tour here and there but when you're when you're just doing like you know back in like you know pre-live nxt when you're just canning four episodes at a time it's a lot easier to kind of do that stuff Especially when they have that, that the schedule for taping, and then of course yeah. they have a completely different pay scale as well. So it's like exactly you have a little bit more room and a little bit more freedom to to do things like that. Um, hmm. Hey yo, I got a question. 
Go ahead. Yo, the way <laughs> the way you talk about um like the way you talk about like yo, I was Bianca's writer, or then like so is that how it goes? Like when it comes to writing for like wrestlers and stuff, does like certain writers just go and take certain wrestlers like a public defender or something? It's yeah. it's <laughs> Yeah, you essentially you. It's just like a ticket system. You get like your number and you get called. Um, so who's the who's the Saul Goodman of the writing team? Yeah. Like, like, break it down for me, man. Like, you know. you know, who's leaving? Like, yeah, who's like, leaving from the wire? Be, be leaving. You're definitely leaving. Chris is leaving. I appreciate that. That's the next thing I want to say. Um, uh, it, it varies a bit, like. You know, sometimes like you bounce around between people. Like I, I got really hooked up with Street Profits. I got hooked with Bianca. I eventually started becoming our truth writer. Um, uh, I know, like before that, I wrote like a lot of Sammy stuff. Uh, but mm. you know, Sammy would change a lot of that because he's really creative. I write a lot of Samoa Joe stuff, and he would like keep it. But you know, it sounds so much better when he like he can make anything sound awesome. Um, but like I think like when you're really showing you can write for somebody, you kind of get assigned that that person, um, and like you really nail their voice, and it just becomes easier because like the the deadline is so tough with a weekly live TV show. Like lead writers, like they don't they don't really want to le- rewrite you if they don't have to, uh, just because there's so much going on. Um, so I think like there's a character element of it. Like if you really find somebody's voice, there's also like you know the crossover segments that are like you know at the top or end of the hour those are the most important segments of the show um and they're also the biggest segments they're longer they're eight to ten minutes um so you have your crossover writers like i like at the end like i was like i was writing a lot of crossovers um and like you know here and there throughout like you have your couple people that you bounce around for crossovers where it's like you know if they they can write for anyone or if like you know there is a specific talent you have like that one writer writes really well for but doesn't write crossovers you can have them work together on it and tag team it um yeah so it's it's kind of like a thought process like i like um there's also like when you're at tv you're you may produce people that you don't write for um like I, like I would, I think like I may have, had, I produced a lot of the Seth Cesaro stuff and like I produced a lot of the Ray, Dom, Seth storyline. I think like I wasn't writing that every week though. I wrote, a, like I, especially when I was on Raw, I was writing a lot of the Raw stuff on SmackDown. I think I kind of um, would get TV with the assignment and stuff and I would rewrite it. So you talk about like the crossover like writing and stuff like that. Like what's up with the continuity thing? Like like <laughs> I mean what's up with we, it's not good. So <laughs> <laughs> do we not like have like somebody that oversees like oh this happened before because like now like we're seeing like like them drop certain nuggets on like on commentary how like these performers have faced off here and there before and da 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 if you've seen this back in PWG you know that da 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 Ricochet and Sami Zayn have had a match before and yada yada yeah whatever like how do, like is that something that uh in your opinion is that something that you think may have been more like an ad lib thing or is that something that like may have been like an edict across the board like nah we just only doing like wwe stuff like we only talking about that and we not necessarily like getting into like actually dropping information about this like yeah i feel like i gave you just a lot just there no 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 it all all makes sense like i so there there has been continuity people at times like on the on the shows Mm -hmm. um they're not really doing continuity in that way um when it comes to like magic and stuff they're doing story continuity so like is this beat being carried over from last week um are we not telling the audience any important information for the story in this script Mm -hmm. uh when it kind of comes to like past history and things you know I, i think vince just probably felt like nobody knows what pwg is or like the majority like the mainstream audience doesn't so like why are we confusing them and like why are we promoting another wrestling company 
Uh, I think I think I don't know if like the edict changed. I I think like Hunter probably just feels like if it's organic and you want to say it and it adds to it, uh, do it. Yeah. I feel Simple it. as that. Hmm. I got a bunch of situations that I want to ask you about. All right. <laughs> let's, do, let's do some situational comedy. Okay. Um, the Sister Abigail stuff. I don't know, okay. like you know, whether and whether you have involvement in these types of things uh, that that I got listed here. You can say yay or nay, or just give us your opinion on you know that situation or whatever. The Sister Abigail stuff, and I'm and I'm not talking about like the like the hints and the references towards. I'm talking about when they were leaning into the sister Abigail stuff where like, it was like supposed to be like Bray versus Finn, but he was going to yeah. come as sister Abigail. They did the whole morphing of the, the thing. Yeah. With the, the veil, veil and everything. So here's the thing about being a writer. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, well, a couple of things about being a writer there. Uh, I, I do not have any involvement in that story, uh, but I think like a lot of, kind of mm -hmm. a lot of times, like, when I was there, if if you had an idea, <laughs> most of the time we know an idea is bad, um, and we know something sucks, and we know it's like, can you believe how dumb this shit is? Uh, the The job though is to, to make it good, or at least make it presentable. Mm. Um, and because of like the the way the the, the company structure, sometimes you can do that. Sometimes you have to go through process, 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 and it, you eventually can't make it to the finish line. Like I remember <clears throat> my second year of the company, um, a segment, uh, the Lashley sisters, um, horrible idea on many a levels. Um, but those were the marching, those were like the marching orders. So, uh, the writing team put three of its best entertainment writers on the segment. And the goal of it was like, all right, how do we make this enter entertaining and good? And if we can't do that, let's at least make it not for offen offensive or bad. Like, how can we get it to just be like, we got through this. Um, and like the original segment was awesome. Like that was written. It was really great on the page. Like, um, I think it's like some of the TNA guys, or I'm sorry, Impact guys now. Like, you know, Robert Evans was involved. Um, uh, a couple other people, like it's Angela Fazio, who pitched, who was there for like ten or twelve years. Freddie Prince brought him in. He he was a a writer who wrote like a lot of killer segments, and he actually pitched the CM Punk leaving with the title story. Um, he was on it, um, and they wrote something like really great. Um, and I think like when people were seeing it, like they there was like objections to it, uh, even though it was like toned down to what the original pitch was. And then I think we got to a point in the afternoon, like a couple hours before the show went on, where you know the segment was fine; it was watchable. Like it was not going to be what it turned into. Um, but then like a couple people went to Vince and tried to convince him to kill the segment completely. Um, which, you know, sometimes when you tell a, a person something who has opinions that he's wrong, uh, they dig in and he went back to the original concept. Uh, what air? So, so, so like, out of air. <laughs> yeah, ex Damn. Exact, exactly. <laughs> so like, you know, that's the the example I always cite. Like the writers on that segment did awesome. It's just like what ended up going on air was not um, not what they wrote. Um, and when it so, comes like sister sister Abigail, I'll, mm -hmm. like I I'll say this just like I you know I don't know if he's listening to this episode, but like so for like me with when it comes to Bray, like I was lucky enough to produce a couple of Firefly Funhouses, and I did um, like the episode where we we had the clock go to the undertaker's debut. And I was like really excited about oh. that. Um, and Bray is a very fun character, but the person who has done such unbelievable work with Bray, why, why is this writer, Nick Manfredini? He was also, he's, he's still there. He was Cody's writer on Cody's first run. Um, and Nick kind of was like the genius behind all the Bray stuff. 
Um, and, you know, Sister Abigail wasn't great. Um, but, you know, sometimes, I think Road Dog talked about this on his podcast recently, where, you know, like somebody can kind of be doing something really creative and really awesome and it catches fire. Um, and like Vince puts his hands on it. And I think that's what kind of happened with the Sister Abigail thing. Um, and yeah, just for what it's worth, like there, and the reason I bring up Nick is just cause like, uh, I think Nick is one of my favorite writers in WWE or anywhere, but a lot of people, a lot of people take, you know, take bows and credits for the Bray Wyatt stuff. And like, you know, it's, it's Bray and Nick, like, and that's every iteration, whether that's like, you know, Swamp Bray, Firefly Funhouse Bray, uh, but yeah, it's, I think oh, like yes. a lot of the times, like when Bray wasn't working, uh, people were trying to get their fingers in. Hmm. Now, when you talk about like uh, Vince kind of getting his hands on things and things changing and things like that. So when it comes to uh, that whole thing where people say like, oh, Vince, uh, he came and he ripped the script up right before the show. And now they're in a frenzy. They've got to rewrite the whole thing on the fly and da, 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 da. When something like that happens. How true is that? Or how close to the truth are those rumors? And like, how do you handle like having to like completely work from scratch or like reconstruct something just as it's happening or just like before the show is supposed to begin? Like, are you there live? Do you get the call that you got to come up with something quick or how does that work? You're you're in the production meeting and which is supposed to start at noon and never really does. Um, a lot of the times too, like Vince. Now, mind you, like Vince will approve the show like a couple, either a day before or a couple days before, and sometimes he'll like gone through the script too. Uh, you know, when you're there, I think like the hope sometimes is like he reads the show on the jet. So he has, you know, he's on the jet with lead writers. So like you can kind of start getting messages so you can start to get into it. Um, you know, the, the show would change. There have been times where like the show would change a lot or like a little. Sometimes it's just like when you're ripping up the show, like put in the context, like you're changing matches. <clears throat> um, and like you kind of go in and it's like a weird thing because like in those production meetings at the time, like everyone kind of had to show their value. So like Vince wants to hear from people. So like when I was on the home team, for example, and I was Skyping, I always had to make a suggestion. Even but even though we had just spent six days putting the show together, we sent it as a team. We feel good about it. Um, so like depending on suggestions, depending on this, that, or the other, um, you know, it's it's it, it changes. Um, it's never. It, it's rarely ever like a. A like it is seven thirty, and we are literally tearing the script up, the entire script up. Um, the show, a lot of the times, wouldn't go out till like eight thirty. Sometimes if it starts at eight or even nine, but a lot of that time is like you're still working on the show throughout the day. Um, you know, I would say like a, more often than not, a lot of times like you knew what you were doing at like six thirty to seven. Um, so it gives you an hour to work on it. Um, when you kind of know something's blowing up, like um, you're you're working with the home team of writers too to kind of like start reworking stuff. But like a big part of like when these things change is like talent getting the talent getting the script. And like you go talent and you get their takes, you have to bring them, you either send them into the lead writer to present. Or like go with the talent into Vince, or go by yourself to Vince to present the changes. So that will change things too. And that, you know, I think like it's less about scripts being ripped up, and it's more about like when do things get approved. Um, and sometimes things don't get approved until like seven thirty, eight, because you're like you're going through on Raw like a three hour show, and if you're reviewing the draft the final time, Vince is going hopefully like line by line through it. Um, so that, that takes a minute. Um, but yeah, a lot of times when the shows would implode, it would be in the production meeting. So you're usually like around four o'clock, you're knowing the big changes. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So like, um, 
and change mm-hmm. happens a lot when you have a process like the production meeting is like you have all the writers you have vince you have hunter you have kevin dunn you have all the producers slash agents you have the digital team uh and everyone kind of feels like they have to make suggestions in mm-hmm. No, oh, because like the digital team's gotta like make like all the graphics and like the shit like that. Yeah, like, we gotta or get like, like packages ready and things like that. Like yeah, or like if we're taking like a like if we need like have a small match and like one of those shorter segments and we need like a story, we can do that on digital. Mm. Um, and also they also like kind of talk like promote the show um, online too. Okay, that makes sense. I got one yeah. more question. I'll turn it over to Ben. Um, how receptive were Bianca and Billy Kay to the idea of them being paired together? And did it even get that far? Didn't even get that far. I was, I was working on that for like post rumble. Um, I'm sure Billy Kay would have loved it. Um, like, <laughs> I don't know how. Uh, I guess the what? Uh, yeah, it's, that was like, yeah, Billy, Billy was, Billy was awesome. I still text with her now. And then like, I, she kind of became like, I always kind of hope like you know truth and i became like really close and like i was if you saw like i was putting the pay-per-views together like the scripts for them so like for the last my last like 18 months there like truth was on like every kickoff panel uh whether that's like him like dressing as elmer fudd thinking like bad bunnies bugs bunny or whatever like or you know doing the title change with the gobbly cooker like it, i would always find a way and like billy k was starting to become that person for me on, on smackdown so i was like I, I even like was in one of her videos of Santa Claus. Like she was so awesome to work with, and like I think Bianca would have been cool with it if we yeah. we pitched it. It's just like we, you know, we found something, or we got lucky that all like, well, lucky that it worked out, but also like through her hard work, like she put her position like self in a position that like when she got the opportunity to really just crush it. Oh. Yeah, so, like, while you were there, probably one of the most controversial things I should probably say from, like, you say you're there from 16 to 21. Uh, yeah. Kofi Kingston getting squashed by Brock. Like, walk us through that. Yeah, it, it was it was pretty shitty um, uh, on a lot of levels. Um, you know, we kind of knew that uh, – it was the Kofi story was like so awesome and everyone like loved it and it made everyone feel like really good. And then like that summer I was like enough, like a lot of the Kofi crossovers, like I was writing a lot of stuff with him and Dolph. Um, I was writing some of the stuff with him and Randy, uh, the stuff with him and, and Joe. And like, you know, it, I wasn't producing any of that. I would just do the first drafts and send them in. Cause I was on the home camp time. But like, I was like, I was really proud of that stuff. And like, we all kind of knew uh, when SmackDown premiered, Brock was going to win the title. Um, but I, we never knew the match was going to be like that. Um, and uh, it was like, oh, oh, okay. Um, and I, I think a lot of people were stunned by it. And I think part of it's like when you're dealing with that high level of a talent, and it's really like this in like any form of entertainment or any walks of life, like the higher, higher you get, the more responsibility they have. And I think, and the less people involved. And I think the feeling was that, you know, Brock was leaving, Brock wasn't going back to Kofi. He was going to Kane and um, they wanted to build a Kane match. And they felt like that dominant, um, of a performance was the way to do that. Um, I think it sucked. And I think the thing that like really sucked about it too was like, uh, you know, I, I never think a loss is like the worst thing in the world. And I also think like a loss like that, like if you look at the Becky Bianca thing, which again, not ideal, but it rallies, I think it rallies the fan base around somebody. So I think there's like a positive element to be had. Um, I think the, the the thing that really bummed me out, and I think it had a really negative impact on Kofi as a as a character. Um, Kofi the guy, awesome, and amazing talent. I think it's like everyone can agree. Uh, he was going to have an interview the next week um, on 
on, on SmackDown and be able to respond to it. Um, and, you know, those types of promos are kind of really make or break, break promos. And uh, due to time, because it was at the end of the show, it was cut for time. Um, and I think also, too, because like the way Fox, there was some confusion over how Fox and WWE were timing SmackDown. So um, that kind of played into it, too. But it was like, oh, like we, you know, he, he had this horrible loss and we're not hearing from him now. Um, and the segment that was written was like a, a very well written segment, and I think it would help Kofi. But you know, it sucks. It feels like Kofi, you know, Kofi was given a lot that summer. Uh, like he beat Randy, he beat Joe, he beat Dolph, uh, Brian, he beat Kevin Owens, uh, he beat like everyone, and he was looking like a really dominant champion. And you know, it just kind of sucks that, like, that summer that was so great, that, like, Kofi Mania that was so awesome, you don't really, it, it, it doesn't really bear fruit right now, like, the way it should. It doesn't, like, it doesn't bear fruit right now, like, how it should, like, Kofi should, Kofi should be a Roman opponent. Uh, he should, like, he should be in main event things, and, like, he's not, and I think it's partially because of that, and then, you know, I, I also didn't love like what happened with him and Lashley last summer because you kind of doubled down on it. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. it was an opportunity to like really rebuild him, and like I think, I think that that's like one of the good things about Hunter now, where like Hunter can kind of look at a match and like how do we make both people look good without burying one while building the other. How do you Thank make people look good without burying one versus the other? Um, you know, AEW does this thing with a ranking system where, yeah. you know, they have like matches mean something and the the the, the winners and the uh, contenders are determined based off of, uh, I don't know if it's strength of schedule or <laughs> all just wins and losses. But you know, it's the BCS system the that they got up over there, nigga. <laughs> but I do remember that there was a time. Uh, I don't remember what year this was. It might have been 2018. Uh, There was a SmackDown top 10 list that was introduced. Yeah, it was supposed to be like (laughs) it was supposed to be like a ranking system to determine challengers for the champions. What do you recall about this? What was the idea behind it? How did it crumble and disappear so fast? Um, so it wasn't supposed to be a round. Um, it was like supposed to be a one-off deal. It was always intended to be, and it was a Vince idea. And it was just like a simple way to get Randy, if I remember correctly, Randy Orton to be pissed off. Uh, cause I think he's ranked number nine in it. I have to go back and I would have to go back and look. I think that's how it is. I may be wrong cause it was a while ago. I remember everyone hating it. Um, but like to Vince's credit, like he, he knows, you know, he understands live audience psychology and like there were moments when it was referenced, um, like where it got reactions from the live crowd and like it got what, you know, he wanted from it. Um, so yeah, it was like very short. It was always intended to be short lived and just as Uh like a, a simple entry point into a story. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Randy was number nine. Ty Dillinger yeah. was number ten. Ha ha. <laughs> yeah. AJ was number one. Nakamura three. Naomi four. Bobby Roode five. Usos seven. New Day was six. Becky Lynch is eight. And it looks like Charlotte's at number two. But yeah, yeah you're right. So he just kind of boop, 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 boop to build that story. That's interesting. I see a lot of people were thinking that it was an entry point to that being more of like a this is how we're going to determine who's going to be the number one contenders and who's going to, yeah. how we're going to set up storylines and build things out with that. But that mm-hmm. wasn't necessarily the case. No, it's just sometimes you just need, sometimes it's just trying to find something simple to get you into something. Um, sometimes you just, you just need a vehicle to yeah. kind of get you there. And people yeah, like, I, <laughs> yeah, people do. It's very, it is a like, and Vince has said that people like listen. Um, but like, it's also like, I remember, like, I wish I, 
I, I blanked out a lot of that, but there was so much consternation around that list and like the production meeting where it's just like, why would he care? Like, why would, why would anyone care? But like the audience actually cared. Like at least like the live crowd, like really cared. So if they didn't care, then why would they do a Royal Rumble every year and they do the countdown 10, 9, 8, 7, yeah. 6? Like, man, yeah. people love counting and shit. Like, I don't know why. Maybe it's, maybe it's yeah. Sesame Street in them. Um, <laughs> hey, I want to ask a question about, because I don't know I don't know if you know, but you know Ray what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, you know Ray J, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, 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 Ray J and I wrote the segment for what I'm about to ask you about because, you know, I don't know if you've seen in the rest of the news, but there was a little bit of a kerfuffle over there on the other side. <laughs> And I want to know, oh, if you yeah. Ever, yeah. I want to know if you ever seen any, um, any a uh, backstage fights, and you ain't got to name no names. I don't want no names, but no, I'll name names. So, no, I don't like. So I didn't see it, but like this was like uh, the. So my, I had a pretty crazy first pay per view, which was uh, 2016 SummerSlam. Um, and like it was wild. I like one, like again, going back to the Brock stuff, like we had no idea whether Brock was going into business for himself or not. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, but, like, then we found out like that was like the plan. Uh, it was like wild because like one Cena went, oh, Cena put AJ over, which was awesome. Uh, Finn got hurt, which was like horrible. Um, and I really learned a lot about wrestling right away because like there was like six months of plan Finn Balor storyline just out the window after that. Um, but then like, you know, the Randy thing, he's just like pouring blood, but then he's just like, you know, he walks into the writer's room to use the bathroom, just covered in blood. Hey guys. And you know, that's that. <laughs> but um, I heard the, I heard the commotion from the, um, from the, you know, <laughs> Chris Jericho and his funky bunch going to confront Lesnar uh, like you know, he, he went rounded up like you know Enzo Mojo there was a couple of other people I like I think it made no, one of the shining way. stars um, and like to go confront Brock and like it was like a like he's talked about it so like I, I don't feel that's why I'm okay bringing it up but like it's not a pretty wild thing and like there was also a feeling though that like you know obviously Brock is Brock but like if he made one misstep like you know, Jericho did beat the shit out of Goldberg, so there was a feeling like, oh, like, you know, he, he, he might catch you if you if you make a mistake. So, but like, I I didn't see any of that. But like, going from like, okay, so I have this man that I've seen for X number of years on my television, just drenched in blood, peeing uh, next to me, and then you know, oh, it's like Brock Lesnar, Chris Jericho, and a gang are going to do. Are are having a throwdown. This was like yeah. literally my, this was like literally my first time at TV because my first two weeks I was on the home team. This was like a home show, and then like this is my first time ever being at like an event like backstage. I was like, oh okay, so this is how it is. Uh, yeah, that's lit. <laughs> that's hard. Hey, yo, that's Jericho, hard. Got Izzo, man. They're about to go yell at uh, Brock Lesnar yeah. real quick. <laughs> so I've, I've I've heard that story like five or six times. <laughs> I've never heard the part that Chris Jericho rounded up like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's him. funny. And right that's, back at it, that's probably a that's probably a very smart decision to like that's <laughs> that. Yeah. Like, that's that's right. How many people did he ask? I, I think it was like four guys. I think it's I think it's somewhere online too. I think you like you Google it and find it. But like it also wasn't like he was going like locker room to locker room. Uh, like he. Uh, <laughs> Like I think he was with them at the time, and like it was like, oh, uh, okay. and then they jetted. He's like, nah, let's go do this. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> let me show you how the business cool, is done. Yo. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Okay, so let me ask you this. Um, hmm. so yeah, I asked you about drafts. I asked you about. Okay, boom. I wonder, Eric Bischoff and Paul Heyman were brought in as executive directors. I believe there this were. was like. May of 2019 or something somewhere around there. Yeah. This is so like did you get to I, I know you've got like a relationship with working with Paul Heyman and things yeah. like that, you know. Paul's great. But yeah, uh did you have an opportunity to work with Eric at all? I mean, like he was only there for I think like 6 months and then it was kind of gone, I mean, but uh <laughs> like uh, 
was there an actual like idea behind that whole thing? Because the idea of the executive director, like that kind of evaporated really fast as well. So I'm like kind of asking about things that like I was interested in that just yeah. kind of like disappeared. And it was like, well, what happened with that? Yeah. I, um, I think what happened was like, so like with the Eric thing, I never really got to work with Eric because I was on raw. And during that time, like the brands really became separate. Mm-hmm. Um, mainly because I think they probably have kept everything the same if it was just Monday, Tuesday. Um, but yeah, it was just like, you are on the raw team. You're not really seeing the SmackDown guys anymore. I would see like Eric once a week in office. Um, like I saw him when we did, I think raw reunion in Tampa and like a couple times and he was nothing but nice and like really smart and a really good guy. Um, I think like, so I don't really know what, why that did not work out he he comes off as a person who has a really great business mind um i think the advantage paul had compared to eric is like paul never left the business um and like when you're getting back into wrestling like it's it's a lot like it's so if like you're doing that and then you're moving across the country from montana moving your family across the country the job is not a nine to five job it is a 24 7 job and you have to like learn, relearn the business. It's a lot. Um, but I think Eric's like, Eric comes off as such a smart and nice man. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's obviously had a Hall of Fame career, um, whether he's in the Hall of Fame or not. And like, you know, I, I think when like the field's even, like Eric, like seems like a guy who could be successful doing anything. It's just, it's difficult. Like you're over you're it's that is not an easy job. Mm. Um, Getting in the groove and like scheduling and like the workflow of it all. Yeah. And like, you gotta learn all the rules of the company and there are a lot of rules there. Um, so it's a lot. Um, but yeah, Eric, Eric seems cool. Yeah. yeah the rules, like no leg slaps, no piles drivers. Don't say yeah, wrestling. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> don't look them in the yeah, eye. Don't squeeze me. I don't think wrestling was ever banned. I think the words professional wrestling were. And so like you could say wrestling, I think just the idea was when you hear the words professional wrestling, Mm -hmm. you think of like, you know, the 1970s people yelling into the camera um, where the idea is to make WWE a bigger form of entertainment. Gotcha. Was there ever Uh, any... uh, Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you got it. You got it. You got it. Oh, like like what he said, like uh, what Vince said in the interview, like we're trying to like kind of separate ourselves and like create a brand with saying like WWE superstars versus yeah. so professional wrestling. That's all I want to say. Go ahead, Graham. So like a marketing thing, right? So, yeah, exactly. Boom. So <laughs> what about that that one time where all the McMahons and, and Triple H, they all stood in the ring together and they said, you know what, fans, we're going to – step back and we're going to put our pride to the side and we're going to give you guys exactly what you want. I'm one of the people that am of the opinion of they kind of gave a lot of people what they wanted after that. You had Kofi Mania, uh, Becky Lynch was popping and all that. So I'm like, "Eh, we kind of got what we wanted. Like we, we went to bat for all of those people and they all had prominent positions, but like, how do you feel about that? How do you like one, how do you feel that came off? And two, do you think that like, it, I don't know. That it didn't delivered? really. Yeah. I think like, so I, I think everything you're saying is true. Like those people, like they had the fans hearts. They, they got those runs and you know, they were being listened to on that. Um, I think the negative thing about the promo is like they put all the heat on Corbin. Yeah, and I think the the heat on that made him very toxic and got him X Pac heat, which kind of sucked for him. And like, you know, say what you will about Corbin, uh, hell of a worker, hell of an athlete, um, willing to put people over, uh, willing to try different <clears throat> things with his character. Um, I think I think Corbin is a really talented heel and really underrated. Um, and I think that promo set him back a minute. Um, 
and it took a probably until like they did the the lottery storyline um yeah. or like or, or him losing his money or whatever that storyline was after i left the bum ass corbin get, thing yeah to get him like back back on solid ground i think like i think the issue with it and it's an issue i kind of had at the company at the time like um i think the brock stuff at the time wasn't working and i think everybody was really tired of it um and i think if i am correct that promo was done after roman left and uh after brock went over braun and saudi um so it just kind of felt like more of the same and then you're losing like a you're kind of you know, for those months, it's, the show is really his show because you know, the title's there, and you know, obviously he puts stuff over in New York, but you know, it's still like three or four months of that show, and you know, I, I think a lot of the things that irritated people with WWE weren't necessarily pushes of of talent. I think it was just like, you know, like not abandoning storylines because, like, if you're a fan and you're watching something. And you give you dedicate three weeks of your time to something, just abandon it, it sucks. And then like sometimes like just random weird booking decisions. Like I was there that night, um, that they did that oh, wow. promo. I was in the crowd and um I, it was the first show that I took my daughter to. And so she was really into like Sasha Banks at the time and Sasha was hot, you know, like red hot. And it was just like, yeah, we're going to give the fans what they want. And then like she taps out to Natalia in like four and a half minutes. And I'm yeah. like, what the hell was that? <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter's in there with the boss time glasses. She's like, forget this, man. This is stupid. I'm like, whatever, man. But yeah. yeah, I just I just always wonder like about that particular thing and how that went over and like you know whatever but whatever. Um, different question for you. Hmm. Actually, you know what? Let's play a game. All right. I got a couple of names here. I got a couple of names here. Uh, rapid fire. I'll just throw them out and uh, you tell me your opinion of that person. Uh, you know. Uh, and whatever. You know. Whatever happens, yeah. happens. Um, Kevin Owens. Amazing. Uh, he was kind of my, he was my favorite wrestler going uh, when I started the job. Um, he is such an amazing performer. He makes everything you give him better. Brilliant ideas. Um, you know, I, I think the boat was kind of missed with him a little bit. I feel he should be a much bigger star. Uh, but I think Hunter is going to rectify that. Um, and yeah, I think he's just a, a great person as well. Um, and I never, I always felt confident in any promo I produced with Kevin. Like, you know, you have a you have a talent that knows every word on the page, um, and you know, Kevin or like Seth, they're guys who are going to kind of say what they're going to say, but like you trust them more because they know the story and they know how it works, and you're in communication on like when you have to like hit the music and things like that. Um, but yeah, Kevin's one of the most versatile talents in wrestling, and he's uh, one of the best people, and I'm a huge fan of his. Shorty G. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just ha- I'm just happy he's doing well now. <laughs> <laughs> Andrade. Hey, I'll, I'll take Go ahead. I'll, yeah. one quick thing about Gable. Yeah. Right. Really, he took it like... Again, like sometimes you really are like what you make of something and he took something and went all in on it and was, you know, he made something better than what it should be. So like props to him. Hell of a, hell of a talent. Hmm. Shoes, please. Shoes, please. Shoes, yeah. please. Um, uh, I was saying Andrade. Great. Right. Uh, Andrade is great. Like I, I worked a lot with him uh, at NXT and mainly at NXT, not as much on the main roster. And uh, it's really interesting when you work with somebody who uh, who doesn't really speak English. So it's like figuring out like that, um, like that dynamic of how to communicate during the promos. But like my favorite Andrade moment is this was when we were doing the PC shows 
Mm -hmm. And it's like, obviously, like I have a bias for the street profits. And we were doing like, I was producing a segment with another writer where it was like him and Garza cutting a promo. And it was live. And for We Want the Smoke, Andrade mimicked smoking a cigarette. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I I was scared to death that we were going to lose the, the catchphrase. <laughs> like, 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 I never, I've never thought of it like cigarettes before. Yeah. Especially because Vince, Vince hates tobacco. So it's like, oh, God, God damn it. <laughs> like, damn so I, well, luckily, I don't think he saw the, saw the segment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so real quick, how do you, like communicate when there's like somewhat of a language barrier do you just like grab google translate and be like i'm trying to say this to you like, sometimes but then like you also kind of like an interpreter or like somebody yeah. to kind of play buffer zelina at nxt zelina was really great with that and so was uh tommy N. um but yeah sometimes when you're just like with andrade it was just like you're trying to figure it out like he, he does speak some english but not a lot and i speak I speak no no Spanish, so it's, it's just like hey, like <laughs> he's like I would, absolutely no help. <laughs> yeah, I, I would like I would use Google Translate sometimes and then like mimic where I, where he should stand and stuff like that. Mm, Got gotcha. you. Um, also, I'll say this: I'm not saying he's one of one of them, but there are a lot of wrestlers who don't know English that uh, there are suspicions of uh, might be a work. Mm, yeah. Got it. I'll, yeah. Got it. Um, I don't think he's one of them, but Pentagon, yeah, it's, huh? It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a little bit of that. Uh, a little bit of that doesn't work for me, brother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Rhea yeah. Ripley. Uh, I think Rhea's great. Uh, I didn't really work with her all that much. Um, mm. But yeah, I think when you kind of see her in ring talent, she's good. I think she's. You know, still so young, and I think she was been put in like big spots a little earlier than intended. Um, mm. And you've seen some growing pains, but I think she's going to figure it out and kind of get where she needs to get. The Usos, the best, just the best. They're so fun. Uh, they they're just they're just great, and they're they're probably the best tag team in the world. Like for for years, like their matches, like how many how many bangers have they had on kickoff shows? Just kickoff shows are like, it's like just kickoff shows. <clears throat> like they, they take away from the opening match. They're so good. Listen, I'm gonna throw a chair at them. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to do that. Yeah, my favorite Uso moment is like I, I, or not my favorite moment, but I was working with them once, uh, right when they had turned, or like maybe like six months after they turned heel, you got away from like the face paint and stuff, and like, uh. We we're trying to figure out like rhymes, which I'm not good at. Uh, and I had like so a was line you about, doing the 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 Styles P Jada Kiss stuff, no. helping them out with that. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was more I was more I was more taking dictation. Uh, like, <laughs> yeah, I was uh, I was their secretary, and like it was I wasn't working with them that much. It was just like one segment I was doing with them. And okay, I thought like, you I, was finna turn your hat around and start. No, 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 no. I was like, no. okay, oh, man, oh. lip up. <laughs> Uh, but I pitched like a line that about cops in there, like, um, which was more like talking about how like they would fuck up cops or something. Like, yeah, we hate we hate cops. We're not even going to mention them. You're right. You're right. All right, bro. You yeah. Correction, that was yeah. okay. like, definitely mental note. <laughs> like, yeah. duly noted. Mm -hmm. Got you. Yeah. Got it. Um, Sin Cara. <laughs> all of them um, yeah <laughs> my thought is like there was like Sakara Sakara is like a, the deja vu wrestler where uh, um, there come times where like oh we gotta put we gotta push the guitar <laughs> and then like realize like you can't like these the promos aren't getting over because you can't see his fucking mouth like, like, and like, like, and this happened at least twice when I was there, yeah. and like three to four times before I was there. Apparently, mm -hmm. um, and I think like 
you know, I think one thing I learned about Sintara is like, you know, being kind of ready for your opportunity. You kind of have like an opportunity on SmackDown once. And, you know, I think you got to kind of know where you work. And like, I think his punches weren't what um, Vince wanted. And like the push kind of ended. And like, I, I kind of learned that I started telling talent a lot of the time, like, these when you're having a match, these are the three things. I don't know. I don't know anything about. I know a little bit now about putting a match together for my next tea time because I spent a lot of time in a room with Sean and Hunter. But you know, if you can, if you can sell, take your time, and throw realistic looking punches, a lot of other stuff is going to be fine. Um, hmm. And the talent that did not do that, uh, like, you know, didn't they would lose their push. Natalia. Oh, she's so nice and so kind. Um, and it was just like lovely to work with. I think she's one of the most underrated wrestlers in the world. She's she's always on point with Esca, always come with ideas. And like, you know, she's kind of the backbone of that division. And WWE is so lucky to have her. Shout out to Natalia. Yeah. Gang, gang. Um, Adam Cole. Uh, he's, he's he's my guy. Love, he's love a sweetheart. Cole. Just he's the nicest guy. Um, such a big fan of his. Like he, you know, I was telling you guys last time. Like we we wrote. Like I I worked with him a lot during my NXT run. Mm-hmm. Um, and like it was it was sad to stop working with UE when kind of they stopped having uh, main roster writers go to NXT. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, he is he's so talented. He's he's he is one of the best wrestlers in the world. I just got a few more. I just got a few more. Shout sure. out to Adam Cole, aka Chug. What is it, Chug or Chub or whatever his little Chug. gaming name? Chug. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, Jeff Hardy. Um, I didn't get to work with Hardy a lot. Um, I pitched the one segment I, I pitched with him was um, that 20th anniversary segment to get into the Samoa Joe story. Um, but yeah, I didn't really have a lot of, like many opportunities to work with the Hardys, unfortunately. Uh, you know, the Hardys and Rusa were like the, the two that kind of just didn't happen. But man, that I was in Gorilla when they came back in Orlando and like the way that kind of, it was kind of shaped like a roller coaster. So you were high up. Yeah. Um, you felt it shaking with how crazy the crowd was for them. Oh shit, that's dope. Yeah. That's dope. Okay, shout out to the Hardys. You know they do big things. Um, let's see who's next. Oh, Randy Orton. You know, Randy is like Randy has a has had a reputation for being a dick um, <laughs> over the years, but uh, he was really awesome to me and like really nice and like he was a you know, the, the Randy Orton I saw was like a awesome locker room leader really funny um under underrated worker um Mm -hmm. and yeah he was just like really great and like he was really he really cares about his family um and yeah i saw him like really help a younger talent out like i know when like drew was having his mania run he would Mm -hmm. pull drew aside and give him like tips and stuff and um I'm i'm a fan of randy's as a person Shout out to Randy. Uh, last person on my list was, uh, you know, forget that. Um, name <laughs> changes. Name changes. Yeah. What's the deal with that? <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> when you hear, I want to just talk about names in general. Name yeah. changes and the names that they just give people. Like all of this Von Wagner, and <laughs> like extra, like where do these names come from? Why do they name people what they name them? <laughs> I'm sure you have nothing to do with that. I'm sure you have nothing to do with that. I'm sure you, but no, we kind of do. Like, it's okay. So, like, well, when it comes to the names, um, there will be times where, and it's not all the time, um, you will be asked to submit three names for a person. And the writing team does that. Creative Services does that. 
um, a couple different departments. So like, you know, Vince would get like a list of a hundred, 150 names. Chili McFruits. Um, yeah. That has been, been on there. My favorite was this writer, John had like pitched, uh, which I actually thought was a good one. Like you also do nicknames too, or monikers. Uh, like mm. a, nick, a moniker for uh, Grand Metal Leak was uh, the Rumble Beat, which felt, which I, I, I really loved. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's like you know you, that's how you do it, and like I think Vince kind of thinks of it would think of it as a couple different things. Like I don't think he wants uh, he wants his talent to seem larger than life, so that's why sometimes like you take a, a name away and give somebody one name because like, you know, Vince WWE was coming, was becoming popular in the day of Prince or Madonna or like, you know, that stuff. So he thinks like the one name makes a bigger star. Is that's, why, I, yeah. that's why you and go I've for heard. something, something like yeah. a Alexander Rusev to just Rusev. Yeah. And like, um, I have never heard him say that. I'm just guessing. Um, and also I think too, like, with, like, you know, Rusev is like, I think, you know, it, he feels like Rusev kind of comes off more as a monster if you take like the Alexander away. Um, so I think that's kind of the logic of it um, to a point. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's something. Uh, I think he wants to turn these, I think, larger than life and turn these wrestlers into characters because it's an entertainment show. Ezekiel. <laughs> No, Cesaro. Maybe, maybe, there's nothing, listen, there's nothing, no, Antonio is so not menacing. Yeah, that's why you go with Cesaro, and you know, yeah. six languages. You still can't cut a promo. I'm cutting this out. Uh, but anyway, we'll leave that alone. Just how I feel. Uh, let's see. This is the last thing that I have for me. Last thing for me. Um, the Miz and Dolph Ziggler. Yeah. This big story about the Intercontinental title. And and I think it culminated at like No Mercy uh, like 2016, 2017. It might have been like right around the time you had just came in, actually. Yeah. Uh, was there ever any idea about like, yo, Ziggler should lose this match and like, <laughs> like recalibrate his character and like maybe come back? repackaged or something like down the line or was it just like nah like he's he good the way he is world. yeah that that story was pitched and approved before i i started so i don't know um oh, no, no, no. but um yeah i remember it being like a i think it was a really good story um i think you know the issue with doing something like that at the time um for smackdown smackdown was so um at such a small roster. Yeah. Uh, so it's like they could not afford to lose anyone. Like, <clears throat> that's why, like, you know, Swagger became a free agent and, like, moved to SmackDown. Uh, that's why M Mickey James was brought back. Um, and, like, just because, like, oh, it's, there weren't, there wasn't, enough, there, it was tough to get a show out of that roster. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Brian James and, you know, Road Dog, Brian James. Uh, Ryan Ward, who I was talking to you about before, uh, seen this guy and architect of the, the women's revolution, and this guy, Stephen Guerrero, who was a brilliant writer. They really, it kind of felt like they, they had a year of that show pre the Ginger Mahal stuff. No, you know, not talking mm -hmm. trash on gender, that wasn't its fault, but like where it was just like they, they were having amazing episodes every week, and I thought that story was like really good. Um, but yeah, you just couldn't afford to lose anyone. Did you ever get to work with the Bollywood boys? Yeah, sure. Did. Dope. They, uh, they're they're great. During the gender run, or during like the like when they went to like two hundred five and went down to NXT and stuff. I probably worked with them like a little bit on two hundred five, not much. I gender was on my call sheet, so mm -hmm. they were on my call sheet uh, when he won the world title, um, and then. You know, because he was a world champion, he got moved to like a lead writer's call sheet. But like, I would I would talk to those guys every week. They they were they would go all out um, and sacrifice their like 
you look at that Randy match, like, God Yo, damn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was about to say that. Yeah, Doing the most. That boy. Boy, yeah. dribbled that boy <laughs> on yeah. the table. Even yeah. he was like, <laughs> Oh, was there ever any serious internal push for, like, four horsewomen versus four horsewomen type deal? I know they did, like, that one little, like – like promo, like not not like a promo, but it was like a like a video yeah. package where they they just kind of like Back met. Stage, it was kind of like moments. a yeah. yeah. Was there ever like a you know like maybe we should kind of like SummerSlam next year or peg it towards whatever? Um, I I don't think Vince was ever on board with it. Um, I think others in the company were. Um, I think it probably could have ended up happening uh, mm. if eventually. Um, but yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't anything ever really on the docket. I think like some people really wanted it to happen and build towards it, but I think it, it, I think, um, yeah, I think I, I feel like if everyone was still at the company now, it definitely would. Hmm. Gotcha. All right. That's me. What y'all got? Y'all did? Cool. Y'all did? Man. Oh, Are you responsible for, Oh, Wendy, was that you? um i i don't know if i I definitely wrote a lot of those promos that may just be joe doing joe i'll tell you uh uh, like brian uh road dog came up with night night uh Uh, and sold a lot of shirts and like him and steve guerrero came up with that great like book uh where like he's telling the story and like uh, but yeah, that's the thing about Joe. Like, I don't know if I wrote that. I don't know if another writer wrote that, uh, if it was on the page or not, but like Joe can kind of take like two words and make it be like, yeah, just very intense and very awesome. But you did work on the, the story time little thing. Some of it, like, not the all nursery of it. Story? Yeah. That's like I, I didn't do the nursery story. Like that was, that was okay. all Brian James and that was all road dog and Steven Guerrero. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Dope. Shout out to Samoa yeah. Joe. He always be yeah. violating people. Like, yeah, so <laughs> he's a habitual line stepper. I'm glad he has one of AEW's 34 titles. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, do you think do you think having more titles or less titles like matters necessarily in a wrestling company? Or do you think it can kind of clutter things? Is that why you I say I think that? it depends? I think the way they're doing it, it's like it's participation trophies. Like like I'm, I'm surprised that like you know I wouldn't be shocked that like when they come back into Gorilla like Tony Ga- Tony Khan gives them like a, a title and a, an arm slice, like <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's just like oh, I, I don't know what matters. Like every like even like even the Owen Hart thing, like give them a fucking trophy, and that's like yeah. the simplest thing in wrestling. You can break the trophy. It's a story element. Like no, give but it's a, baby a title. Fit. Yeah. It's like oh, like everybody has to have a title. Yeah, I yeah, guess so. Yeah, so next next week, Tony's gonna have a title. Just <laughs> so, walking uh, out doing the hunter with those eyes bugging. Let's let go. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, speaking of titles, uh, how many times did you get the text message like, "Hey, man, look, we put the title on me, and I just beat." everybody the what what people call the uh the hardcore holly text like what, how how many times were you getting that <laughs> um a lot uh, <laughs> <laughs> now it's like it depends who and i can tell you off air like who but like you know there was like there was one talent i told you about i think on dm who like i should be a world champion like I'm six seven, former athlete. I should be world champion. Uh, there is one wrestler who I respect his hustle for so much. Who uh, won? I forget if it was the Intercontinental title or the United States title. Supposed to hold it for a week, maybe two weeks. He kept on pitching stories and was able to get them through. And had like an awesome six month title ring. <laughs> and he's like, I know, I know. Uh, okay. I can give it. I can put him over in two weeks. But if we do this tonight, it'll make that match bigger. Yeah, supposed to put up, yeah, supposed to put up four different put over four different people, and like I think he lost the title due to injury or something. Wow! 
<laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Put yeah. yourself into a six month reign. That's hard. Yeah. Yeah. I respect a few few people can do it. But. Smart. Very, yeah. very smart. That's hard. Oh wow. Yeah. So who shut down uh Diddy calling himself Brother Love? Was it Brother Love? <laughs> oh man, that's a good question. I actually don't know, but uh you know. I, just, I think Brother I just... Love. I think Brother I think Brother Love likes the nickname. No, like does it? Saying, I just, I, I don't, I don't know if somebody owns it or, or, or what, but I just know Diddy was like, "Yo, I'm, I'm love, I'm brother love." Matter of fact, I don't even call me Diddy no more. Don't call me Sean. Call, call me, me love. brother love. You know what I'm saying? And then it was like, "Oh, yeah." I mean, I, I, know, I do know Bruce loves nickname, so we'll. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, 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 Sean. I would Bruce like to see. Oh, yeah. Oh, who? <laughs> I would love to see that match. Right. That'd be hilarious. I remember one time when uh, there was like a thing between like the game and Triple H and the game, the rapper yeah. being able to call himself the game. And like, <laughs> it was like an interview in like Double XL or something where the game was like, I don't care nothing about what Triple H got to say. We could box right here. We could fight in the middle of uh, we could fight in the middle of Compton. We could use the uh, the the telephone wires as ring ropes. <laughs> I was like, what is wrong with this man? Oh my God. Yeah. And you you thought this guy had like a, like a a small slither like brain power like he's doing like ten minute disses on Eminem right now. I'm like, well, what the fuck is he doing? I'm running a company right now, bro. <laughs> yeah. I'm talking to Snickers about a multi-million dollar deal. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, Mr. JC on. Um. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. What do you think about uh, NXT 2.0 and that whole experiment? And are you glad that it's over? Um, I mean, like, I, I don't think it was bad. Um, I think, like, the branding of it was off-putting because Hunter wasn't involved. Um, I also, like, I, Sean, from my understanding, Sean was telling the truth that like he was, you know, heavily involved in the creative of it, and like I think like the issue, there was like a real issue of, you know, and a bunch of people we've talked about, like you're bringing in these indie wrestlers in their thirties, all incredibly talented, but you know they have taken a lot of bumps. And you're investing your development dollars. Like, and you know, we're all basketball fans here. Like, if your team drafts a 22 year old, like, you're why is why, why are we drafting a 22 year old? Like, you know, it's like <laughs> you want like maybe a sophomore, but like, um, and it's kind of like I think it kind of became like that too, where like you were investing your money in people who had like gone around the world, done all these crazy yeah, matches. Yeah. And it's just like going back to the bump card. So it's like, I think the positive thing is like they built up fresh new talent. Like I think they have done a great job with Braun. Um, you know, I, I think Harlan's cool. And like, they have a lot of people now who are developing and finding themselves. It feels like the NXT of, you know, 2015, 2014 in a way. And like, I'm very proud of NXT. It was like my, my favorite part of the company was going to NXT. That's part of the job. Multiple reasons why. Um, but I think for the future of the company, you kind of had to change the development a little bit. I think it needs to be more of a mix, if anything. Um, because I, I also think like those wrestlers who have been around the world, like they have skills that the PC wrestlers don't. So I think like any sports team, you need like diversity in your roster. You can't just have carbon copies of people. But like, I feel like, you know, this Roman run right now, the thing I always keep thinking about is like, this amazing run, whoever gets the carrot of defeating him, like that's, it's not like that, but it's like in the vein of like defeating the Undertaker. It is like, a, this is going to be a very, very special thing. And I think you want to give that to the person who can be the face of the company for the next five years or 10 years. Mm. Um, and I think there, I think the development system has put out a lot of great women wrestlers uh, who are phenomenal and all great. I think you don't have <clears throat> the age appropriate star to give that character at the moment. Mm. So as, as a, 
like with your writing mind, if you put your hat yeah. on, to who who is that person? Is there somebody in the company right now that you think that can take that 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 responsibility of beating Roman and like carrying the torch thereafter? Or do you think that that's something that they really need to kind of get the ball rolling on and figuring out and cultivating? Yeah. I think that's, I think they got the ball rolling on that with NXT 2.0. I think there have been like missteps and there have also been bad luck. Uh, Uh Like, you know, Jason Jordan was being built to be like the next guy. Jason Um, Jordan's going to be amazing. Yeah, and there was a whole plan uh, for him, um, and it sucks. He is a he. Speaking about good people, he is such a good person. Um, and like you know, Jason was going to carry be like a a big player, and what happened happened. That sucked. You know, I think Braun. Uh, you know, Braun. I understand people not liking Braun. Uh, I. Did not always like working with Ron backstage, uh, but he was like the person who, while I was there, the first person who was like kind of crossing over into the mainstream. I would feel like Braun and Bianca were kind of like the two. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was kind of mismanaged, so it was like that kind of like I think from a booking perspective, unfortunately, um, in his matches against Brock. So it's like you're dedicating these time to these people, and it's for various reasons, either injury or like you know mistakes in the booking not working out i think right now for me um i feel it should be i'm biased i I feel like montez is the guy um i think like he because i think montez can kind of i think he can be a baby face or a heel he has the body for both uh he has talking skills for both um i think there are a couple minor things he has to improve on but it feels like he could be the the face of the company. I think the other person who's a little further away is, is Braun. Uh, Braun Breaker? Or, yeah? Yeah, yeah Break Breaker. Yeah, um, James. To, to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, because, so bro, you can't do that to me, bro. They just brought <laughs> Braun Strowman back. You yeah. can't do me. I got confused. I got confused, too. He's, he's going to lose the first name. Uh, but, um, but, yeah, like, Tez would be, like, my guy. I, I obviously mm. have a massive bias, but, like, <clears throat> You know, I, and by the way, too, like, I I don't, um, like, occasionally I see people being like, uh, well, you know, when Tez goes on a singles run, you know, yeah. Dawkins, like, yeah, I don't, I don't know how Hunter's going to book things, but Dawkins had all the talent to, and has all the talent to be a massive monster heel. He is a legit 6'7". He is the one of the best shit talkers on the planet. Mm. Like um, he incredibly athletic. He is like a legit main eventer. Um, Mm. I don't know if he's like going to be like John Cena or Roman Reigns, but he can be become a main event player as a single star. Um, And I think he also be a a big baby face, but he has like a ton of skills that make him a, and make him a fantastic main event. heel. And he heard everybody that said <laughs> all all yeah. of the rumbling and all of the all of that chatter about oh Montez would be great to go on a solo run. He said oh, okay, cool. Yeah. And he got in that lab. Yeah. He started cooking. <laughs> and he is a hard fucking worker too. Yeah. So, but, but yeah, if if we clip anything from this, Team Dawkins all day. Yeah. Big uh, action. Yeah, <laughs> Big um, action. He's flipping over the ropes yeah. now. Suicidas yeah. of the tope. Uh, no, for, like he's variety. serious. Like, and I and I feel like it's like a, a a point that he's trying to make, and and maybe not to like impress people, but like <laughs> maybe like for himself and for his own. Like, oh, okay, cool. Like, if this is what the the conversation is around my name, let me show you why the conversation needs to shift a little bit. You know, and I think he's been doing a hell of a job. And by the way, I don't want to take anything away from from Tez. Like, I just said he could be, like, the face of the company. But it's, like, the, the group works because it's an equal group. Yes. Like, like they play off each other really well. And, like, I think they they aren't the same. Like, they have a, a very different dynamic. And, like, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, 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 I think, like, like, if Kane can have a, a, 
a world title, if Christian can have a world title, Dawkins can have a world title. Jack Swagger had one. Fuck. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. If yeah. Jack Swagger can have a world title, Do- Angela Dawkins can have a world title. Big action. Yeah, that's, Absolutely. Yeah. No, because people say really like good. it's interesting. It's interesting that you say like Tez, because I don't really hear very many people saying that. Um, but I hear a lot of people say like Cody uh should should be the one to beat Roman, but you know, somebody younger or like somebody like Braun Breaker, uh, you know, yeah. uh, those are kind of like the names that I typically hear. But Tez, yeah, that's a that's a dope option as well. Uh, if Carmelo they Hayes. wanted to break off that Carmelo Hayes, yeah, him too. Yeah, I think if you, I think if, yeah, I think if you, <clears throat> there's a really good story if they do it right. Um, that's a breakup story between the prophets. Um, yeah, like if, if I have, Tez is a baby face. Like I booked that match just like the Betty Guerrero Brock match. Mm. Um and you know, like he like Tez is so athletic and so amazing to watch. Like like he's a he's a highlight reel of himself and like he is just a legit star. Mm. I agree. I had this uh vision uh like a week ago of like <clears throat> recreating that that moment which is now i guess like a controversial moment and you know because he who he what what is the thing he whose name shall not be spoken should not be named yeah Yeah. (laughs) benoit yeah we just call him him the pegasus kid that's funny (laughs) but that moment that That's moment great. where it was like him and Eddie in the ring together and you guys celebrating that too. their championship reigns. Yeah, the, Pegasus, the Pegasus kid was in there, you know what I'm saying? You know, the Pegasus yeah. kid won the World Rumble in 2004, you know? We'll definitely yeah. just run it with the Pegasus like, kid for sure. Be get over, get over. By the way, I was, so mm-hmm. you guys can keep this in or not. I was, my boy Dave Schilling and I uh, were talking about doing a podcast. Yeah. Um, and we, we couldn't close the deal. So it's, it feels like it's, it's not happening. So I, I feel comfortable saying this. Uh, I was, I either want, I was going to talk to you guys about this. I was either going to name, because I think we all have the same feeling when this promo happens. But I was either going to name a call, <laughs> podcast Keeping It 100 or do that. <laughs> or do that as like, do that as like, like Dave going like, oh, Chris, how's it going? I'll just keep it 100. Like yes. opening up the show. <laughs> uh, like <laughs> that is great. I, I wish I had that clip. I don't even have that clip to do that, but that is hilarious. Oh. Yes. I was I was on the same page. I was at the forum when that happened. And you know, it, it kind of erased any like you know, a lot, a lot of historic moments have happened in that arena. Yeah. Bigger than any Lakers championship. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing bigger than that, man. Yeah. Salute to Athena, man. She made a moment. She made a yeah. moment. Hunt <laughs> yeah, D. She put her flag right. down. She definitely put her flag down. Uh, that's pretty much all I got. Was there any? Is, yeah. Was there anybody in the wrestling uh, uh, industry that you didn't get to write for that you feel like you had a really good idea for that you just didn't get to get off? Is there anything like that that was just like, oh, I wish I could have. Mm, if we could have did this, yeah. That's a good question. Um, you know, I worked with, I was very lucky. Like I worked with literally like everyone from the Attitude Era, like mm-hmm. Hunter, New Age Outlaws, Sean, a bunch of Sean stuff, um, Austin for Austin through 16 day, uh, which was something. You uh, did the, the thing with the Austin <laughs> and the pandemic when he talking to the chairs. Oh yeah, I thought I was getting fired that day. Uh, <laughs> Rudy Gobert gets COVID, and I find out I'm flying to Florida. Um, I don't know how that tracks, but I did. Um, but yeah, working with Austin was the best. It was just like a, it was a wild time because nobody thought knew what was happening. Um, yeah, that was also a promo I wrote where you write the good version of that promo. Um, I had something where like, I had like a, 
we had to incorporate a janitor in it. I don't know if it, it made the show. I forget, but like I had the janitor have like a heart attack in like an over the top way. And at Austin, which I think Austin liked actually, was like uh, Austin 316 says don't die. Um, and uh, <laughs> 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 Whoa. <laughs> oh my goodness that is great and uh, just to show you how production meetings go uh, somebody who's not on the writing team raised their hand and said to Vince uh, Vince with everything going on with COVID right now I think it's inappropriate to say Austin 316 don't die or so, and uh, you're right just taking it out of the script so <laughs> like <laughs> Yeah, those production meetings get pretty, like, you just, like, look back, keep the receipt. <laughs> sitting there like, yo, this could have all yeah. been an email right here. Yeah. No, but like, you you've, had, you've had the script for 20, 24 hours. Just email me. That's funny. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's That reminds me, I'll tell you, a, uh, quickly, I'll tell you my favorite. So, yeah, person I probably wish I got to work with a little bit was Jericho. Like Jericho was there when I was there. Like I, I pitched segments for Jericho. I never actually got to write for Jericho because Jimmy Jacobs over at Impact Now, brilliant writer, uh, wrote a lot of like he came up with the Festival of Friendship, all that stuff. Um, a quick dumb thing I never got to do. Uh, I'll give you two quick dumb things. One we did that we ended up not airing uh, that did not work. And then uh, one thing we, that got cut every single week uh was i was re- i during doing the, all the the off sites with the prophets and the viking raiders i became like really close to those guys uh, like all four of them um and the when we kind of made like that's also too like trying to take an idea that's not great and turn it into something um because the original concepts for that not great um but the, it worked out really well um we, when we kind of accidentally made Ivar a ladies man character, we wanted to do, have him talk and eventually open a, a website um, that would be Vikings only, like farmers only. <laughs> um, um, I think we changed it because of OnlyFans, like to be people getting confused to like Vikings mingle. Um, but like it got, we literally <laughs> had it in, in the script for like seven to eight weeks. And because of how crazy the pandemic stuff was, like things kept on changing on the fly all the time. Um, also like a really cool moment on the, like with, with that friendship was like, we were trying to, we had to like write a new segment and like Dawkins was there and Dawkins wasn't in the segment, but we, I think I, we were talking about like Dame Lillard and like we, we all just started writing a segment together that threw myself, Ivar and Dawkins, where like we had like I, Ivar time, like game time, uh, <laughs> like which was fun. Um, but a really hard, a segment that did not land that got cut when we were doing like the comp, like the, uh, all the, um, all the pandemic stuff was like Truth and I had an idea for a segment that we thought was fucking funny, uh, where because he had won the 24 seven title so many times we were waiting for him to get to a number with like five. So we got to 35. So we wanted him to do the Booker T five times, five times, but like, and just go. And he did. And it was amazing. It's just, we, it was just like, it, it kind of bombed, but like in the most amazing way possible. So we got it. You can save this. For the I don't even know if that's PG. <laughs> Oh, I can't wait to. Oh, I gotta tell him you have that clip. <laughs> we love truth over here. All right. uh, he's he'll be on my wedding. Yeah. Love him. That's dope, man. By the way, how was vacation for you? Ah, it was awesome. Yeah, speaking of Harry Potter, went to the play in London. Oh, Pretty what? Shockingly what? Yeah, it was sh- like and I was like really negative about the play because it was a lot of money and like. We were originally supposed to go last year, but COVID shut it down and they would not give us our money back, even though we don't live in the country. Um, But yeah, like the special effects were wild. And then like 
we spent a lot of time in the countryside, like London and uh, Scotland and France. It was just like all awesome. That's dope. Yeah. Did you go to the Clash of the Castle? I'm just kidding. Oh. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, I told him the only way, only way I would go is if uh, if uh, Roman put me up. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna be sitting right next to Bret Hart. Yeah. <laughs> just He's like, no, no, no. no. Hey, you got Tyson Fury to knock out uh, Austin yeah. Theory? Like, no, no, no. Let, yeah. Give me that spot. Give me that yeah, spot. I'll I've been waiting to push. <laughs> I had, a, I had a moment like that once uh, where if you go back and watch the Gargano Ciampa match uh, from, I think, New Orleans on the uh, leg crutch guy uh, <laughs> in the match. So it gave me an excuse to say, like, I said for a year that I was in the match of the year. Yeah. The last one. <laughs> Yo, I just watched that. I just watched that shit. And I just and I remember that that spot. Yo, that's hilarious, man. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. That's good. I was that, and then my hometown as a rib. I was the cheeseburger in Noah Jose's conga line in, in oh, the Prudential gosh. Center. <laughs> oh, gosh. But, yeah, no that is Yeah, I, I feel I'm killing Amazing. the momentum now, just, like, talking about dumb things. No, so, that's hard, because, nah, like, was, honestly, like, because I was thinking about, like, yo, like, being a writer, like, how do you, like, like, when I was talking, when we were thinking about like, like the draft at the beginning, like when we first started talking, like, I was like, yo, like, I wonder like how, like how easier or how harder does it like help to have like a set roster like that? Yeah. Because like, if you get dealt like somebody like a no way Jose, literally the person I thought of, like, how do you like, how do I book no way Jose to a world title shot? Yeah. Like, I, I, I don't know. You, you, know? you book him to a, an episode of main event. Um, it's right there. there you go. <laughs> It's like he, he booked himself that flight to AW Dark after that promoter in Canada yeah. gave him that money. Damn. Just, yeah, what That's what they say. Bag. I don't know. That's what they say. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Last question I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to get yeah. out of your hair. I'm going to let you guys all do your thing. But um, if there's is there one person on the WWE roster that you feel like can really be a game changer that they're not necessarily thinking about? Like a somebody like a diamond in the rough to you that Dark just like, oh if they just give that somebody the ball and let them run with it who would that be? I think they're doing pretty good right now. Um, for me, again, I have a, a big bias. Like I feel, I feel like the the street profits were like going up and up like this, mm -hmm. and it kind of plateaued a little bit. Um, and I don't think it's because of their work. I think it's kind of a little bit because of the booking. I think like uh, after I left, I'm not sure if it'll, what happened on SmackDown, but they just uh, kind of seemed to kind of, um, yeah, they just haven't had the stories. Like, um, which kind of, I don't know, like the Uso stuff is great. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think they, they can kind of use more because I think they're crossover stars. I agree. I agree. For me personally, like I agree with that one. I'm also thinking like somebody like a like a Mustafa Ali. I think he's really good and like like some of the ideas that he seems to have and like even like some of those promos that he cuts that he seems to like shoulder a lot of the work himself. Uh, you know, or at least that's what is said about it, you know. Yeah. I think I like he has Ali. pretty good ideas. Yeah. yeah, he's a good guy. Dope. Dope. You guys got anything else? And nah, I got my questions off, man. Gang, gang, so I'll fight man. any next thing I'm talking about, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really appreciate you for taking time to to hang yeah, out with us. Thank you guys for having me. It's, no, uh, I, it's been great. Um, now that like the podcast series is over, I'm trying not to do any too many of them or any of them really. Uh, <laughs> but I, you guys, your Twitter account and your podcast, I I check in on all the time because it's just stellar. So I appreciate that. Yeah. I'm going to ask you this though. What do you think that we can do to like kind of be a little bit more out there, but less like, like, cause like, this is the thing, right? This is what I'm having trouble with getting interviews from like WWE 
in like communications it's like i'm like are we too edgy are we too extra is there too much <clears throat> like does the pr department probably you know like or the media uh, department um, look at us and be like see our shit and be like ah mm, i don't think not. it has anything to do i don't think that has anything to do with you guys okay cool um i think that's them uh mm. i've been trying to go the AEW route more um mm. because i think they're more open to that stuff um i mean i think the same thing but we also interviewed big swole who like kind of yeah, <laughs> said something about the owner <laughs> so i'm like ooh. it was right yeah. after too. Like, so like, I feel not. like we're kind of in a like a weird yeah. like shadow banning situation where it's like nobody really wants to like give us a shot. And I'm like, damn, man. Like, I wonder What's if there's the something that, that happens though. Do. Like, they, they say no. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, they're like, yeah. I'm, not, I'm comfortable with like battling through the nose, but I'm just like, hmm, I wonder yeah. if like you know if there's some inside information to be like, oh yeah, you guys said this. Remember that? It's like they, that's a no no. Remember you said Tony? <laughs> remember you said Tony Khan does a line for every show? Yeah, we we paid attention to that. <laughs> yeah. I I remember you posted that picture of Bray Wyatt burning, and you said Richard Pryor colorized. Yeah, oh my God. we saw that, <laughs> and we told Twitter about that. That's why. That's why. I, 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 I remember that one. <laughs> Well, I like. Uh, all right, man. Well, this has been amazing. Uh, before yeah. we get up out of here, Chris, of course, you know that you're always welcome. You're you're yeah. always very kind to us, and you're always a, a pleasure to have. You know, what I'm saying on our, on our show. Uh, yeah. Please uh, give us your Twitter. Tell the people where they oh, can yeah. find you, locate you, um, everything. Yeah, yeah it's uh, at the at the Dunniverse. Um, and yeah, just you know, follow me if you can, and just keep listening and watching this show. It's awesome. And anytime you guys. Need a guest? Uh, hit me up. I'm always down to talk to you. Big action, man. We appreciate uh, that, man. Oh, and by the way, yeah. Uh, before we go, one thing. Um, my my future. I think my my girlfriend's Jamaican family uh, really enjoyed the Bob Mon Chris uh, nickname uh, you gave me last time. Yes. <laughs> Bob Mon Chris. Yeah. So it's uh, very over. Uh, you gotta uh, get it on a you gotta get it on like an ugly sweater during Christmas or something yeah. like that or like you know holiday yeah. season or whatever mm-hmm. you don't know, get it right. Trying Bob my Chris don't do no eggnog. Yeah. Like <laughs> trying to learn a lot of terms, like don't mess with your little friends then. Um <laughs> so, yeah. well, we appreciate so, trying, that. Trying trying to learn. So <laughs> That's hard, man. Well, we got uh, damn. You know, what? we'll talk about that off off camera. But yeah, yeah. This has been dope. This has been fun. This has been great. We appreciate you taking time. It's yeah. probably longer than we allotted. So thank you so much for being okay. so generous. And like that, we go. See you guys.